Okay. Uh, so, <coughs> what we what we see in connection with the monocentric or mononucleated cities are one center uh, where the M, the central or the central business district, is the most important location in terms of of land rent, and, uh, and this attracts activities with high returns per square meter of land where they can uh, do with uh, let's say less area per per uh, unit of production so to speak and with high returns so this is uh, an expanded view of, of uh, this fountain monocentric with the concentric zone model with different activities uh, in, the, in this functional space. Outside of, the of, uh, of zone 5 we have the, let's say, the agriculture land in this, in this model. Uh, so, talk a bit more in detail about about the functions in the central business district. We historically it was a railroad hub, con collection distribution uh, point for industrial and uh, agricultural products. It's a market place uh, with uh, a lot of of production also including uh, manufacturing uh, shopping node connected to the to the railway station and uh, also with uh, different cultural amusement activities so this used to be the situation um, and it's quite intuitive uh, intuitively reasonable because the transport network was not that well developed they had the, the railroad ra railroad connections but uh, way back <coughs> not that much uh, of uh, of roads and uh, and car use was modest car ownership was modest and then uh, we have seen this during the last decades with uh, increasing car ownership, increase in the, in the expansion of, of the road network, with the uh, increasing suburb suburbanization. And this has taken place to a, a very varying extent around the globe. Uh, we have talked about the American cities, we talked about the European cities, which is more condensed, but still, uh, as I showed you for Paris, it's quite dispersed, even if you have this, uh, this condensed uh, central business district with a large center. But uh, a lot of activities is moving out from the CBD, and quite far out distant, quite distant from the CBD, again depending on uh, on transport costs. So you see that transport costs is kind of a very important determinant for this, uh, this development to take place. And uh, there is what we called path dependency. Because once you have created a uh, dispersed, spread out area, it's, it's hard to reverse this, uh, this, uh, this pattern. And uh, as I said on the earlier occasion, a dispersed, spread out structure is very vulnerable to a 
sharp increase in energy prices. So it's, uh, it's very hard to, let's say, get accept for a, let's say, a radical increase in fuel taxes in the United States of America. You can understand that if we go there and see the, the urban structure of some of the cities. Not New York, not San Francisco, not even San Diego, but if you go to Dallas, for instance, you get, uh, you get the impression of, or Los Angeles, you get the impression of a very spread out structure. In some of the uh, central business districts, you have also a decline in population because uh, the um, manufacturing industry closes down. The most pronounced example in the, in the Western economies are Detroit in the United States, where the car manufacturing industry has moved out from the, from the city. And uh, I think they have lost some two million inhabitants during the last 20 years or something. Households <coughs> move out to, um, to suburbs because of uh, the increase in the transport quality again. Uh, some of these uh, types of patterns are used also in, in let's say, in, uh, in planning of urban structures. There is a very strong focus now on developing uh, economic activity and residential areas around transit stops. So if you have a, a subway with stops, it's, uh, it's a pronounced policy in uh, Oslo and other capitals that development of uh, economic activity should take place there. Because then you have, <coughs> you have a rather energy friendly and rather, let's say, reliable system. Uh, and it's, it's good to, to have the growth located there to avoid uh, too much spreading and too much car use. So we get from, as a result of this, in many bigger cities, the commuting problems with the peak load uh, on the transport network during peak hours, like uh, congestion, both on, uh, on, the, on the, in the road network and also for buses and, uh, and subways. And this is a ki kind of, it's a story of how the world works in many cities. But it's, uh, it's interesting to observe that this pattern can actually be influenced in many cities emerging in, in the emerging economies, which still has a very concentrated structure and where a sharp increase in car ownership in the countries like India and China can, if they are it's not well planned, result in, uh, in uh, let's say, the same conditions and the same problems as we have in the US. Um, This has been the development of, uh, of, of manufacturing. Single level manufacturing plants, it's, a, it's an explanation behind why manufacturing is often quite land consuming. It has to do with the internal logistics of, of the factory. It's better to have everything on, on the same level. Uh, so uh, 
it's uh, it's easier. Access to to the railways, uh, and again the network made it possible to locate away from the from the CBD. And in addition, as connected to to what I've said earlier, that uh, the central business district was more attractive to other types of activities than manufacturing. We got this transition <coughs> where manufacturing moved out of, of the city center. Retailing. So what I'm doing now, I'm going through some of the, let's say, segments of economic activities and how it has developed over the years. Retailing is, of course, uh, attractive to the customer, so it's, uh, it's a good way to, they, they follow the households. But not necessarily always, because uh, the shopping malls can be located quite distant from where people live because of the access to car, to car use. And that is why some countries have started to regulate the, the establishment of, uh, of the shopping malls. Like in Norway, we have a regulation. We don't want to build shopping malls out in the middle of nowhere, as we did particularly through the, throughout the 1980s and 1990s, where many shopping malls were located in the middle of nowhere, totally or entirely based on car use. So if you study the pattern of how location of shopping malls has developed, it has been a, a total change to, towards uh, location of shopping malls in the city centers or very close to the city centers. And preferably close to, uh, to um, subways, bus stations, and so on. Offices. Uh, Corporate headquarters started to leave congested high-cost central locations. Uh, in Oslo, we had the same uh, pattern where uh, offices started to to locate themselves uh, southbound from the city center. Uh, it's a certain logic in that because it's uh, often nearer to where people actually lived, so it was not necessarily a a bad thing, but they uh, they started to abandon the central locations. That trend has slightly reversed. Nowadays, it's uh, it's a, it's a it's an emerging trend that uh, offices are returning to the central business district. And <coughs> when we talk about locations in uh, and town planning in the, let's say, contemporary town planning, one is very focused on flexibility in the built structures, the buildings. It's a plan that we should have uh, buildings or uh, office buildings, office blocks, close to the subways, subway stations, but it's also an objective to have those buildings designed in a very flexible way so that different types of activities can, can, uh, can locate themselves there. So to have a certain possibility of having the dynamics in the location uh, pattern so that one type of business can move in to replace another type of business without having to uh, to to rebuild the whole structure but just make make uh, let's say smaller adjustments i've shown you i showed you this in the introductory lecture 
and uh, and this is uh, actually it's from 1922 it's uh, some hundred years after Fontinen but this guy a Swiss architect he had read his Fontinen and he tried to think about town planning and, and development along the same lines with the transport <coughs> transport node located in the middle here with the high with the upmarket uh, high return productive uh, companies located close to this center and then you had a let's say a declining willingness to pay for land as you moved out from this this uh, this this center and out here more area consuming uh, smaller houses and so on so this this sketch of uh, modern town was based on Fontaine's ideas actually and it's very uh, schematic but you can try to look around a bit and, uh, and see if you can find some some examples that could remind you of a structure like this I mentioned one in uh, I mentioned one in Paris the the La Défense um, part of Paris is uh, quite similar to this structure it was built through the night throughout the 1980s so this shows the an example of uh, let's say improved or changes in accessibility uh, and uh, the post World War II structure started to become like this with ring roads surrounding the city center and that was a what, what that was a kind of a uh, quite innovative uh, change because it made accessibility between different parts of the let's say the bigger greater paris or greater london or even greater oslo much more accessible instead of going like this using uh, half an hour if this is minutes you can go directly in, in 10 minutes and of course this this affected the, the location pattern and made it more more attractive to to get secondary centers and uh, and suburbs along these uh, arterial roads but they were from history quite strongly based on on car use uh, now if we study the development of Oslo since the year 2000 we have gotten one line like this it looks approximately like this but it's a subway So they have not expanded the road capacity uh, along this yellow yellowish line, but they have expanded the subway capacity instead. And the transport economists like myself, I was not involved in that project, but uh, a colleague of mine was. And he said that this is the first time in my life where I have, where I have been radically wrong in my calculations because this new subway line was considered to be very very unprofitable but it turned out to be the opposite so it's it's uh, it's extensively used now and uh, and that's been kind of a success and I'm <coughs> just showing you this. This is these are more or less citations or uh, or uh, 
things that can be found in the in the planning documents for for Oslo. Try to develop service industry around nodes nodes for uh, for uh, for the shuttle trains and uh, and the metro to reduce urban uh, urban sprawl and car use. Try to get rid of. Uh, of the land consuming activities in the city center and get them out of the of the city center and to the surrounding areas along the arterial transport corridors makes sense because they are land intensive and also transport intensive retailing <coughs> located near residential areas not these uh, big shopping malls which can be justified from hotelings location theory, but which is perhaps not a very good idea when it comes to to uh, to um, energy use, especially not if they are located uh, away from the central business district. But we have a new challenge, which is uh, connected to to an area which I will not discuss in this course. It had to do with city logistics or urban freight. Because if you have the shops close to where people live, you may have some conflicts of interest with respect to, uh, let's say, lorries coming in at night, loading and reloading uh, things, makes a lot of noise and things like that, which is, a, which is an issue. Manufacturing, uh, out migration from Oslo. Um, which has actually been very pronounced during the last uh, 30 years, and it still continues. So this is uh, where I'm going next Tuesday. So that's why I will not have the lecture next week. So I will go to a conference there. Uh, not there, but in Atlanta, Georgia, which is uh, two hours flight from New York, but I, I need to go to New York for at least 24 hours, just for leisure purposes, so to speak. Uh, <coughs> but it's, it's uh, uh, we will come back to this in, in, in subsequent lectures, why we get such extreme concentration of, of economic activities on very limited uh, bases of land and uh, try to explain then why, why we have this concentration um, in central business districts. And then we have, we'll talk about uh, scale effects, and we talk about knowledge, spreading of knowledge, uh, and uh, wider economic impacts. Well, this some just some observations before we uh, before we close this uh, lecture this is uh, distance from city center <coughs> and population density persons per uh, per hectare and uh, for for various uh, various cities around the, around the globe and this is uh, this reminds you a bit about the land rent and bid rent curves. Scarcity of land, lots of people want to live or have to live. Because here in New York it's a question of perhaps want to live in a very central area. If we go to, um, I'm not too familiar with Bangkok or Jakarta, but some of the cities in in the developing parts of the world, the population density is too high because the living condi conditions are, are, are not, not too good. Ooh. Because of um, lack of transportation systems, they need to go there for, for work and, and, and the living conditions are not, uh, not good for that. So the <laughs> reasons behind this is different. In New York, 
In New York, you have you have this pattern because it's uh, there are some good economic reasons for for it. Here, it's perhaps perhaps more a matter of necessity. You have to go there to find work, and uh, and so on. Density and land prices. Some, uh, some, uh, just some illustrations of uh, from four cities: Paris and uh, some cities in in, in Eastern Europe. Same pattern. So this lecture is an when you read the uh, lecture notes and uh, and the uh, readings, I think you'll get a fairly good impression about this topic, the interplay between the land rent economic activities, transport costs, and uh, I have actually. After I, I read this the first time, this type of literature, it was possible to recognize why some urban structures are looking the way they do. And we'll uh, continue with some couple of other theories which will also shed light on that uh, later on in the course. I will post some exam questions within not too long, so that you can start working with uh, with exam exercises also. I'll try to do it before I leave for the US so you can have can have a look at them next week as well because there will be no lecture then on, on uh, next Thursday. Okay, thanks. <laughs>